Hello everybody. Glad to be here in Alderloor where Bonnie resides and does her wonderful workshops and the horse workshops. And it's an absolutely gorgeous fall day. Perfect New England weather. And so part of us is trying to get as much sunshine through the window as we can and look at that. And we're here to explore the topic of ego development and how coaching and what we call tailor coaching is might be different from what we call regular coaching. And just as a dialogue with each other, uh, find out what we know, what we might puzzle about. And to start with, I'd like to each one of you introduce yourself briefly, just really very little, and what draws you to this topic or to this inquiry. I start with you because I know you. <laughs> well, hello everybody. I'm uh, Charles Silverstein. I'm with the Graduate Institute, uh, where we offer some coaching programs and. Um, Actually, Suzanne and Reggie and Bonnie have been uh, guest faculty in our programs at the Graduate Institute. And um, I'm not a coach, so I didn't bring a, uh, a client case, uh, but I'm interested in coaching and how it um, is integrated into theories of development. Um, so that's why I'm here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lily. I'm not a coach, um, but the reason that I'm interested in this kind of activity is that I, I have many friends and colleagues who are coaches and consultants, and I'm intrigued by what they do. <coughs> and I also see that um, it would be lovely to have a, a group of support, a, a, some sort of structure of support so that we can go out into the world and do our work while having a, a base to come and have feedback from, from other people and to grow and to continue to grow as a professional. And um, May, uh, when we had a gathering here, and I, I happened to, to observe interaction between uh, Christopher Spicer and Bonnie, and, and after that I talked to Reggie and other friends of mine, and I saw that, you know what, how about we just do it here? Um, so that's how it started. So I want to thank everyone here, particularly Bonnie, for hosting this place, um, providing the space for us, and thank you, Christopher Spicer, and then thank you, Reggie, for inspiring this um, event, and then particularly <laughs> a big thank to Suzanne who agreed to come here with us. So this will be the first of, I don't know, um, how many more to come or whatever this gotta go. I'm, I'm be interested to explore. Thank you. I'm David Slade, and um, I have an ego, and I'm hoping to develop it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm interested in, uh, you know, so I'm interested from that personal perspective. Like, what, what is? It's an interesting distinction. What am I, and what is my ego, or what is? How do I function in the world? Um, and I'm also studying uh, developmental coaching with Suzanne and uh, and Bina Sharma. And I'm Christopher Spicer. Chris, um, yeah, I'm in a um, have put intensive uh, thought uh, ex experiment into this tipping from uh, ego development to ego. Um, taking apart sort of the elder year thing and I don't consider myself that elder but there, I've reached a point where there's so much cumulative loss that you start grappling with life differently. Um, I work up at UMass Amherst and um, do leadership, communication, conflict uh, management work with groups out in the workplace and I'm also developing my own coaching and retreat business called Integral Guest House. Oh, that's mm -hmm. great. Um, hi, I'm Bonnie, and um, I call myself the steward of Aldelore, and I spend most of my time asking what this place wants of me. 
So that's my relationship to um, this place. And one of the things I know that it wants is to have community and have participation and um, make that kind of contribution. So it's a real pleasure to have everyone here. Um, I don't consider myself a coach, so it'd be interesting to see um, why I wouldn't say that, you know? Yeah. And um, so that I think I, that's kind of an open question for me. I would say that I love, I love to share, I love to teach, um, and I can feel that the word coach has a boundary or a parameter around it that I don't step into. So that would be a question that I have right. to learn today. <laughs> My name's Topher. Um, I am not a coach, although everyone's saying I'm not a coach. I came for a coaching thing. Um, I have a strong interest in the development, the, the coach, the, the kind of human development and developmental coach communities and curiosity about what they're doing. And um, I was coming to sit in and just listen on perspectives of what do coaches run into? What are some of the, that was one of the themes I understand for today was what are some of the difficult situations that you run into and how do you navigate them? So. Thanks. I'm Bill Miller. Um, and I've been a spiritual seeker for many years. And I'm now teaching Waking Down Mutuality. And one central concern through all of that is ego, my own, of course, and also how to relate to it, how to work with it, how to think about it in a 21st century context. And I just know, being with this group of people, that I can learn a lot. So. Um, I also uh, run a mindfulness meditation group, and ego is a big, I mean, it's always been a big concern, and uh, it still is, so I'm just, maybe I can learn more about my own and, and then how to work with others, so, thanks. I'm Echo. Um, I'm not a coacher, <laughs> but um, I have, you know, three months ago, you know, I've been living this very, you know, sort of simple life and following my tradition, which is uh, Chan Buddhism. I've been practicing uh, for a number of years. I only follow the one teacher. So <laughs> I feel like, you know, life is pretty good. You know, it's fine. I'm satisfied with that. And then three months ago, I met Bill. <laughs> And then he throw in all these different kind of um, approaches mm -hmm. and uh, different kind of religious, you know, um, seekers and uh, thinkers and all that. And all of a sudden, I feel like, wow, there's some area I completely <laughs> just like missing. And um, and so um, he told me about this. It's gonna happen. And um, said, you know, it's a good opportunity to come and. Um, so that's why I'm here, but I also read a little bit about what you did, and um, it's very, very interesting, sort of scientifically mapping out what the mind is, actually. And, and, and so my curiosity from that is that, yes, we can scientifically mapping out certain aspects of the mind, but then the nonverbal part of emotions and the intuitions and all that, how do you deal with that part of the human capacity and power and you know, which, you know, you know, traditionally is a through meditation that people get access into those, you know, sort of the so called non intellectual piece. And then um, so that's my that's my question here for the group. And also I'm 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 born and raised in the East and uh, in Taiwan, coming to this country, even though for a number of years, but um, I still feel that, you know, how do you integrate this so-called traditional, you know, thousands of years of traditions of approach of tapping people's at, at, um, the so-called Buddha nature um, he's mapping out uh, as this very, very, you know, complicated and sophisticated way of tapping into the so-called mind is being there, but then coming to this Western, you know, fertile ground, which really, you know, 
very creative people, very, you know, very, um, uh, has a very sharp root in terms of uh, really understand what the mind is or what the Buddha mind is. And how do you then use this thousands years of already developed the, the mechanism, <laughs> right, is working right mm -hmm. there. And then to hear people ready and have the capacity really get into that, the mind, then how do you then merge them together? And then how do you then create a way of just sort of like um, to make that happen here as well? So that, that's, my, that's my question because I'm, I'm having a, uh, I have a weekly <coughs> sitting in my place and, and I do monthly, you know, um, uh, Buddhist study group. So, so, so the people here is, is Western mind, you know, trained, yes. educated people. So, so I feel like um, I understand them without words, but, but you can't teach without words at the same time. So how do you then teach people the things that cannot be taught by words? That's the question. <laughs> Yeah. And the, the way they were, obviously, as well, transmitted, but they did use words. Right. So I'm Reggie Mara. Um, I feel bad. I'm, actually, I'm a coach. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm the right person. Um, I'm, I'm a coach, Reggie. Okay, that's what I'm going to say. And uh, but but I yeah I've been an educator for forty years so I guess that, that yeah, up, ups my my value a little bit uh, and I've been a, been a poet so I, I'm in a fortunate place right now where I get to use poetry and poetry writing coaching and education uh, in all of the things that I do I'm on the faculty uh, at the Maryland <laughs> University of Integrative Health and in MA in Health and Wellness Coaching I work at uh, Teleosis Institute which is actually out in Berkeley. And we actually do training uh, for people who are already certified as coaches, giving them some uh, additional uh, coach training. And I'm on the on a phone coach with Integral Coaching Canada, which is where I actually got certified as a coach. So, uh, and I have a coaching practice, so I actually coach real people, and they pay me, which is pretty cool. So, what what Bonnie said is really resonates too, because there, even though coaching is still kind of the wild west in terms of a regulated industry. Um, <laughs> There are, you know, where does coaching stop and mentoring begin and teaching come in? So there is a, a blend there for sure. And I just love the way this conversation is framed, you know, the importance of ego development and our awareness of it and tailored versus regular coaching. So I just, I'm looking forward to where this is going to go. So you know, I really appreciate being here. And I just loved how you all felt into one of those traps. One way we can say we have a more expansive self or ego is by where we make the boundaries. As soon as you say, I'm not that, you put a whole part of the world outside of your own interior. And so it was just fascinating. It's also sometimes you pick up what somebody says from before, but it is interesting. Imagine that all those distinctions we are making between teacher, mentor, just human being, friend, coach, they're artificial boundaries and they're there for a good reason because we want to have some control over who does what and you know it's, it has become an industry so we need some some we need some guidelines but it's interesting when we then identify that way I'm not that because I don't have the credentials I think is what the next phrase would be whereas we coach informally I'm sure each other here and there all the time with these roles are fluid that we take on so clearly I can do a little bit of lecturing before we discuss the question you raised how do the two the Eastern and the Western come together we say two things we say one Western psychology is bottom up and Eastern the psychology is top down. So you start out with the big mind or the supreme, whatever you call it, and then you incarnate more and more and more, it becomes more and more gross and, and material, the soul or whatever terms you use. And in psychology, we tend to start at the bottom of the newborn child, and we look at how does it develop. 
in all realms, emotionally, cognitively, behaviorally. And so the two kind of complement each other in that way. We're also talking about the difference between growing up, it, which, which this theory is about, and waking up, mm -hmm. which is a different intent. And often spiritual teaching have to do with helping people to wake up, not necessarily to grow up. They may grow up anyway as well as part of, of, of what the, the learning they're doing. But does, these are the distinctions. I think they fit each other nicely now because of what was usually lacking a bit in the Eastern traditions was a good idea of what the ego is. It was just assumed everybody has a healthy ego. We start out there and then we transcend it. But the rough road to how to actually develop a healthy, mature ego is what Eastern psychology has spent a lot of time now on. So that's where I come from. I was always, not that I'm not interested in the other, the spiritual side, but I was interested in how do we become adults? How do we mature once we are adults? And what difference does that make where we are in these kinds of different theories? You, you can just cut, you know, the, the overall territory we know, we agree on the many different theories, how we divide it and what we pay particular attention to changes. There may be five stages, there may be three, you know, pre-conventional, conventional, post-conventional. Post it's just a matter of focus and detail that we're looking at. And we find, or I find, that this particular theory is a totally empirical. It's not a theory. A theory grew out of data, looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of sentence completions. So it's not that somebody had an idea of what the theory could be and then you try to find data to support it, which is what, how most theories actually happen. They're based on very little data. This is totally data-driven, even today. The beauty of that is that you can find pattern in the data. That's what any theory we sort of does. Uh, the challenge is that, of course, new data also challenges what you had before. Especially when you look at the field where people develop, and there are more people developing to the later stages, then sometimes you have to say, well, the theory has to develop too. And that's not a good sales point. People want something that's fixed and static and you know, this is how it is, not this is how it looks like it's it going to point. develop. Yes. So it's just interesting. To me it has to be a lie, or it's not a developmental theory. Development is not static. <laughs> so, <laughs> there. so there's plenty of paradoxes in even working with this kind of material. Um, and in, in a nutshell, how can I say, the theory is basically one that says, from, and you have a, a handout here that shows the arc, and there are many different ways of showing the same material. In this case, I'm showing the arc because I'm thinking life is a, you know, lifespan, a whole thing. And you start out as a newborn where you have no separation, no differentiation, no words yet. You have some experiences already from your being in the womb, but you don't have any way. Mama and you are just one. Assuming the nipple and you are one. I mean, there's just, you know, big nipple in the sky and the joy of being in union <laughs> with that, with the source of, of life, with that milk. Yeah. And then you go through this quite lengthy process of reaching what in our culture, in the Western culture is considered an adult. Uh, Piaget, who is also Swiss like myself, was the first to actually look, earlier in the last century, look at how children develop and said, they're not just stupid uh, adults. They're actually making sense of things, and they make sense of things by interacting with the world. And he looked at the pattern of that, so he described this movement. And then we all thought, and there's still the general knowledge in, in 
sort of the Western world is we all develop up to here about age 20, 25 maybe, and then what? Downhill from there. <laughs> and only the last, when 1960s, were the first ones who said, no, when we actually look at adults, some of them develop further. Some get broader perspectives than what Piaget had as the end point. But it's relatively few, few, so it takes a long time to get the data to actually show that, to not prove it in qualitative sense, but to show there is patterns and others can understand them too. So as coaches, when we go over to coaching, we were saying we're helping a healthy adults, function, not healthy, but functional adults be even more functional. And what would therapy say? What do therapists do that's different? They develop work with non-functional, non-functional. Yeah. Yeah, so people have to suffering yeah. Yeah. who really come to the therapist because they are confused, suffering, non-functioning, addicted, <coughs> all kinds of things that they they need help for. So in therapy, you generally go further back and you look at the origin, the causes of of what what's the suffering. In coaching, you generally look forward and assume people have resources to move forward. And occasionally, of course, then you, you did, after a while you discover there's really something that needs a deeper look, and then you might uh, refer them to a therapist. If you're a responsible coach, you wouldn't think you can do everything. And really, what one thinks I can do and what identity I carry and how much responsibility I take and how much uh, reward I feel myself with for being a good teacher, a good coach and all of that, that is ego stuff. How much am I identified with the outcome of my whatever I'm doing? Do I hold that lightly? Do I see it as just sowing seeds? And they may fall wherever they fall, fallow ground, beautiful, or wait for years before they come forward. We don't know. And that, how people, what attitude somebody has to in their craft, whatever it is, that is a matter of ego development. So a, um, a, an ego, a person rather, may interpret post-conventional experience from a conventional perspective and get into trouble or just lots of trouble, lots of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> you know we all know about the trouble also the spiritual kind of trouble trying so what what we really think is in order to transcend the ego to go back to the eastern sort of general look at things you have to have a mature ego yes but what people often want to, they so yearn for liberation and for something else. They may have had a beautiful moment of feeling that transcendence, the unity at the other end because it comes back. But you, you, you can, with your mind and with your experience, you can tap into peak moments. You can tap into a meditative unity, at least temporarily, and then think you got it. Now I'm here. Now I'm ego transcended. When indeed you're way nowhere near there because what we also think, and I guess it comes from my have training as a semanticist, as a linguist, is that whatever you experience, as soon as you try to describe it, that will look, that will give away where you're coming from. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a, it, this is a powerful theory and that's why we're using it very carefully. Yes. So here we start with embeddedness, then we differentiate more and more, more and more clear boundaries. Who am I? What's me? What's not me? I'm not a coach. You know, <laughs> these kind of clean, clean distinctions which are necessary. And they're at the apex here. And it's what the culture supports, what the culture pays for. <laughs> The most rewards people at the specialist and the independent 
stage or sometimes you call it expert and achiever, that's where the most rewards are. And even so, there is a lot of understanding here, incredible things created from this perspective. The whole scientific endeavor to a large degree comes out of that. Yes. Um, the limit is that there is not yet an awareness of how we have been programmed. So the shift from here to what we call post-conventional to kind of tap into that, the conventional, where we live within the conventions of what's offered in our environment, to the post-conventional, which looks back and says, mm -mm, I rule my ooh. <clears throat> what I thought was that the, the truth may not be the truth, yes? Yeah, I have a question. There, like, so post-conventional, as the society moves, right, so if you have relativist kind of understanding in schools, let's say, I know that's not really true, but as the society moves, does this kind of shift? Like, what? Well, that's what I'm saying. Yes, we know that we already have the evidence. So maybe 30, 40 years ago when the consciousness raising of women and, and uh, what is it called, diversity issues came into being, that came out of this kind of thinking, right. really beyond what the culture had. But now, of course, it's as soon as it gets legalized, as soon as it becomes part of the legal structure, right. then it appears those sentences, those things appear much earlier. Right. And, and you can no longer say they're post-conventional. Before right. they were an index for post-conventional, now they're no longer. I think that's a big confusion, right. like, that, that people, especially in our community, because we, we interface with a lot of people that grow up with kind of parents that have been practicing and have been reading and this and that, and then the children grow up at a very young age and they appear to be post-conventional, but they're, they're not because they're, that's conventional to their reality. Yes. Yeah. So that's interesting. You can even see mm. in different cultures where the, the cultural values at the, are at the later level. I've actually tested that with Switzerland. In general, in Switzerland, the values that the whole community uh, shares are much more like they are today here, you know, conserving and, and recycling, and all those, those ideas, those values, but the people are not necessarily more evolved, they're just having been brought up within those values and mm -hmm. they held them that the way you can tell is the rigidity with which you hold a value. The more rigid, the more attached you are to it, the less likely you are at the flexible, more mature stage. But there, and then there's something else happening that's interesting that is, to me, even more confusing. Like where I used to work, um, you know, we had a lot of Ecuadorians come up from down there illegally. Mm -hmm. And what they had to go through to leave their life and come in and establish their own businesses and their own families, it was now... They wouldn't test post-conventional, but what we did is we went in and we worked with them so that they they had to be taught things like that they knew more than some of the guys that were, it was a landscaping company, so some of the people that have been working there forever were typically Western conventional, but these guys, even though their language skills and their understanding of America wasn't high, there was something about their spirit that was like post-conventional. We made them managers because they had to understand this thing. And that's a real opportunity, I think, that's lost. Because I don't think they would score post-conventional. But there's some, there's something about them that's, I don't know how to explain that it. You, that you experience as a type of maturity. I mean, tend to use that word. Just because yeah, that's yeah. what we call our thing. And that, indeed, if you look, if you look in your own right at that other culture, you would find, we assume, because that seems to be verified worldwide, universally, those big shifts seem to be everywhere. And every whether the culture is collective or individualistic, overall you still see these, and you can still tell who is more mature and who yeah. isn't. You just can't. There may be a totally different knowledge base. It may be... But that shows up there as well. Yeah. yeah.
I, I, I mean, I totally think that would be real. Yeah. And the intuition about their level of capacity. And if you t if you test them with this instrument, no, they would not. But right. that would be not the right instrument right. to use. But like one of the tests, just to ground it, was this one man in particular who we made manager. You know, he would come in and he'd get beat up by the guys. You know, like they tease him and be rude to him and stuff. And it got so, as he gained more power, he was going to push back until it got ugly. And I had could have a conversation with him and said, you know, look at Eric. You know what Eric is. Like he knew that Eric was not smart, somewhat even um, disabled mentally, just a guy, you know. And I could tell that this guy, Wilmer, could see him. And I said, so that's just your burden. You can see him. That's your burden. You have to be higher. And it's not like he went higher and said, oh, I'm higher. He knew how to set in and make, he, Adjust, he nice. had to make Eric feel welcome. That yes. was just his burden. Even though he came on the boat and the whole thing, yes. that was, he and had that capacity. the man shined. Because yes. he, he had the capacity. Yes. The other one did it. And I knew he could see. And so part of, to just build on that part of this theory is also that the later the state you really are, the more responsibility you have. Noblesse oblige, as we say in, in, in Europe, um, that you, that you, that, that's a tenet of all developmental thinking, that higher can see earlier because we have all come through it. We don't, we don't jump, there are other premises, we actually go through these levels. And then we can look back and they're within us. It's like the chakras, they're all there. I may actually mostly use one level, but they're, they're present, they're there. But the reverse is not true. Somebody who is at the really early stage really has no other possibility. They, they, they don't even understand what you're talking about. At this level, if you talked about responsibility, there's no time sense, there's no, just me surviving, just me getting to the next day, just me against the whole world. Other people aren't even people in their own right, they're just sources of whatever I need. And so there you can't blame them if they, you know, you have to pay, find ways to interact with that person that serves them. And so a tendency, particularly in the spiritual and the sort of early post-conventional realm, is to want to heal everything with love mm. and universally embrace. Well, guess what happens if you try yeah. to embrace somebody yeah. down here? The, the ISIS commander needs a hug. Huh? The ISIS commander needs a hug. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't work. Yeah. Really, on this, you can step into the good part of that earlier power and show it. You just father, you're just, you know, hopeless. Yeah. So, the part of uh, developmentally tailored coaching would be to have the awareness where you are, to work on yourself to increase your awareness, primarily and to have enough of a sensibility and an understanding of a good theory that you can sort of get a sense where somebody is exclusively. Most people span a few levels. They don't just stay. The earliest ones just don't have any choice. The more, the further up you go, the more choices you have. And to get a sense of that so that you can tailor. And so what would be the difference? I mean, I framed it, I asked you in the introduction, what, what's the, what do you think is the difference between most of coaching, regular, or regular coaching and tailored coaching? Is there a difference? And what would it, so what? What would it be? I, I, you want to get in pairs and discuss it for a few minutes and then come back and see what you came up with? Just to, to break the pattern a little bit. Sure. Do you want to do three? Yeah. Do you want me to do a timekeeper? How about three? Sure. Should I set up timekeeper? Yes. Two, 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 oh, two, two, okay, so if I like to take three, my phone. Three, 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 three,
Do you have no paper? You might want to no, make some notes. There's no books. Yes. You want some more books? You need some more books? No, I'm good, I think. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I think I can take a That's my question. Like, what is, what is it? The coach, like the ordinary one. What is it? What do they do and what do they not do? Yeah, that like should be done, for instance. And then the definition of so they help the person solve the problem. It's not so much that. That's what really what you need to do. Yeah, but first, Taylor, I'll tell you. No, I just, so, no, just, no, just, just try to start with a basic. Let me tell you, maybe this is like, you know, it's aware. It's not a struggle. It's not a struggle. And the coach would have the capacity to discern that. Right. So, when I keep tailoring, um, and in the regular coaching, there are coaching practices. Tweaking your message. And there's no way to do it. If you're in this case, coach, uh, you know, 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 Maybe the coach so what do you want to talk about this? thinks that the goal is to be like really him, um, about the person Taylor coach, and, and the goal is to be more like three months. Yeah. Yeah. You I may have prepared the space where I learned some about conversation, um, um, but there was not one thing that, that you were helping me with. And what I mean by that, I think that's very difficult. You were just letting me talk about whatever I wanted to. So one day it might be a time where I'm going to go back. Next time I'm going to go back. Whereas Taylor coaching is, I'll just tell you how I practice. Yeah, like, when you come, and that's really cool. Yeah. And basically, yeah. I meet with a client, and once you get all the logistics out of the way, how we can do this, we redefine a coaching topic. What is it? Where do you feel stuck? What do you want to work on? And then we come up with developmental objectives. So, like, for me, three things we're going to develop in this person. That's how I try to achieve that for a perspective. Every two weeks, I get a practice to do it. Which helps them develop myself, help those one, one or more of these objectives that will help them be successful or not. So that's, in a nutshell, mm -hmm. it's a difference between having but I never kind of helpful them conversations them once, or, once like, a week or so, like, or really developing mm -hmm. on a specific right. issue or topic that right. the client comes That's not what you need to know. That's how I would do it. In a way that the tailor coach needs to know more about it. So that would be what the, the uh, sort of coaching and complexity, complexity so what the are the tailoring, they, 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 they tailoring, they tailoring, they experience it as trouble later with uh, uh, stages. Uh, if you subscribe to the paradox, they know. Finding out in the point of view, they are aware of what are the types of Well, I'm just kind of going on the other side. Voice versus. Um, so now you roll with uh, more conflicting choices. It goes for more because you've got to life assessment. do some of this stuff to accomplish your task. Another disaster. See, like for me, if someone came to me, so I guess you know, you know, comes up here, here's my obstacle. There would be another stage of our life. I would not be able to have a different because I'd be like. How do you know that's where you want to be? Like, like that's like why I wouldn't call myself a middle-aged person. But usually it's less about what they want to become and what, 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 what they're up against. And which one I have to be more actualization of some, my career. Some I know, right. but, yeah, but, they're, but they're looking for help because they're stuck. I think it's also, interesting for some to be able to understand what the right is and what they want to do. Yeah, like I want more money, I want to be a better coach. Well, they might want that right yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah, but for me, I have a bias around this. You think this is the I'll <laughs> honor my problem. bias. I know what they are. The idea is the 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 not what they the are. The this comes with a variety this is the of body issues. telling Those them that that's the problem. Those conversations might be just what somebody that's how needs I in a given moment, even though they're somewhat scattered and diverse. That's not wrong or bad. Um, my, my experience is that I've been able to help people much more specifically when it's focused. You know, because what we're doing really is creating awareness and awareness perspective as opposed to providing information that just talking about. 
that's the intention behind it. So using the term of use. Right. So yeah, right. you, you described it yeah. exactly. Right. Any particular right. exactly. Right. 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 right, and so for me, yeah. mostly, the thing to think is the instruction is the signal that tells them what they feel they want is we can be you know, yeah. this, this is that's a you feel that the more that you the more they yeah. 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 They're in their interest. Yeah. 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 Yes, you're big on uh, here. I think I, that's my right. That's the context I'm working with. I imagine that's your concept. You know, I'll use concept. this very explicitly uh, if people are coming in that direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's helpful. But I want to Well, most people not taking that regular approach. Mm -hmm. are uh, that, that, that actually use the, challenge, the model but, uh, comfort motion or one of the now I see your point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it might have yeah, started more. And they'll use that. They're, they're, they're very conscious one exploration of that. Earlier stage. Sure. Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, Most other people. I wanted people, to just relax. And, you know, there would like be a, different tools. An expert tool is not necessarily going to come to you and say, I'm going to throw this question. He's going to come with this story, and then you're going to see that he's got this problem because he's specialized, he's specialized in his future practice. This person's relativizing, okay, we come down on each other, so relativize their future. They're looking to the future, and it's all relative. It's not always concrete. Would you like some more time? It seems like you're still engaged. Yeah. What are you ready to do? Come back. I'm just trying to make sure you have probably the more yeah. aware that yeah. yeah. we could be ready. We made yeah. ourselves good in the third place. We're good students. Really, it's even though we have to go for very soon. Yes. And you can use this model working with her, which is a so little bit more than the airport. It sounds like international officers who are out there would use this as a framework. Yes, that's true. Oh, you know what? Gary had to do this. That's my answer. Yeah, Gary had to do this. 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 Horrible reduction in the book. But it's that's a court conversation. So it's already there. What I'll do is when I work with languages, I'm not sure what the problem is. There's a language here where somebody is developing it. I don't think it's a mental issue. Like I, 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 but they're yeah. conventional. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how do you think that um, somebody is really pretty much like people, there's a lot of people that are there. So the the line for me, most people I need to see that's my question. So this is very, very confusing place to navigate. That's <laughs> and when I meet people, <laughs> say, I have to know my limitations as a person. That what? I my own well, I think it's my own biases. Okay, how much, much of what I just said? So I would say, you, if you put so this in the how do you how do you interact with my own stuff? Yes, that's beyond. That's what I think. Helen Keller does much more effectively than somebody who just said. And you come in and they, you get put into their box. Oh, I see. I've mapped like every Sunday with is taking the view. Can we put this somewhere else so I can use it? It's about you and where you're coming from, not about what's but it's almost as if in this world the mapping the work you do. Yeah, I mean, here, I'm going to be really careful about the work I don't want to be a I know I said that, but I'm kind of back Well, that's an interesting question. Maybe that's what you mean by tailored. There's something that needs to be tailored here that isn't 
So I, I would not get somebody who's highly developed. Oh, tailoring. Something. Sometimes, like, I, mean, I might like own I situation. Just realize that's what tailoring means. Like, there's obviously something yeah. that's yeah. like, well, yeah. and then this needs to be really changed. Yeah. There's so much challenge in your business. It's funny. This is lovely. Yeah, yeah. 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 Y
let's say so and let's say I live as a, an expert that's where I am as in my own life but I don't know that because I don't have the framework um, I have a toolkit somebody comes to me and I have a, a series of toolkits and I'm going to use my toolkit on this client or these clients regardless of where they might be developmentally I'm going to use the same toolkit for everybody that's what I would call regular coaching whereas I have this slightly broader and deeper toolkit um, where I can actually meet a client where he or she is developmentally if I'm working within a developmental framework. Um, so I, I further humanize the client and less objectify him or her because I've done the same thing for myself already. Mm -hmm. that's, so that, yeah, so that's certainly one way of how we look at it and the other things that yeah, came I think, up. I think this is similar and thank you for that because I just realized something so like there's a difference between being a developmental coach and being a coach that tailors from a developmental frame model yeah. so because i think what you were mostly saying <laughs> a developmental coach is interested in moving people developmentally like they come more with that kind agenda. of agenda yeah. and that's i think what we were kind of and so for me the point of this to be a coach that tailors, you need to enter their world and see what is the most appropriate, adequate fit for them. Yeah. So, you know, an expert, we were saying, I was saying that it's lovely to work with these people because, you know, they have, sometimes they just can't, they, a lot of times experts have maps and mental models of the world, and they have mapping errors. And then all of a sudden, like, whoa. And that doesn't, and that helps them, but that doesn't, that whole that whole interaction is still in their world, you know, and and so I think to tailor is be able to enter their world and coach them yeah, from there. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes people are moving, and then you you gonna that's their need is to move developmentally, but that's but it's their need. So you also mm -hmm. listen for that. Correct. Who's need is it? Who sponsored? I mean, in the or the more corporate world, people get sent to coaching. So mm -hmm. they're sponsored by something. Right. So who are you responsible to? It's to yeah. your client, mm -hmm. even if it means that you figure out they should leave the job they're in, or are you you know, responsible to it's the organization who pays you for the coaching? You have to negotiate that up front, obviously. You have to be aware that this is an issue and not blindly fall into it. And yes, there's a difference. So there's plenty of schools and plenty of coaching uh, out there, certified coaches who have a toolkit that they've learned in their coaching school and they just apply it. They apply it either as experts and don't think uh, earlier stages even want to be coaches necessarily. But the expert goes about the business like they would in any other job as an expert. I know what's, what it is, and I'm going to teach you. I'm going to help you learn what I know. So do these exercises. So go home and write a reflective journal. Well, guess what will happens with an expert in a reflective journal? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? Nothing, nothing. Funny thing. Why? It's not really come online yet. What hasn't come online? The capacity to reflect and yes, the, that needs to be taught. That comes later. So that you have all these things that that people learn in their coaching schools that simply are. And Keegan said it most beautifully: in over the head of some <laughs> of the clients. And so tailor coaching means to be really capable to notice what would work here with that particular person, their life circumstances, their roles, their function, and what they offer you as issues that they grapple with. I, I said what Bonnie said, I really love that too, because I think it's actually an ethical issue to go, if you, if you do have a developmental framework, to go in thinking your job is to move somebody, or even horizontally, right. but, but especially vertically, to think you're going to go in and coach somebody so they're going to move from expert to achiever or achiever somewhere else. That's an ethical, that's, that's unethical. It you're, is you're, unethical. You're, 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 you, with the, so you can be a developmental so coach. This is yeah. really cool because we're saying yeah. people don't suffer because they're not necessarily moving. 
No, they that's sound right. perfectly. It's good. not like, oh, you're yeah. suffering because you're you're not constructive. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. we're yeah. saying yeah. it's a matter of fit. Constructive error is harder to be. Yeah, you can There's too many options. <laughs> that right. is, we say that. that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Constructive error, yeah. There's there was a report. They did a study of happiness measures in cultures around the world, and there was a country, and I forget which one it is. Oh, but Tom, 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 yes, happiest mm. collective in the world, but you wouldn't say that they're, then they don't even care about it. I mean, maybe now they do, but <laughs> they have computers and so on. But um, yeah, they're not. They're happy. They're not worried about developing for developing sake. Is the goal? Yeah. They have been recently, though. You know, yeah, because yeah, they said, you know, when they saw the Tibet fall, they said, if we don't modernize, the same thing's going to happen to us. And they finally realized that they want to preserve and move, that, that this was real. Mm -hmm. This yes. wasn't an option. It was real. And it was going to come from the zeitgeist of their own people. So, yes. No, I, yeah, yeah. I, I get that. And which, which suggests, you know, the the impulse for development, is that innate or or not? I guess that's the, the question. Or, and it's well, it's both, but, you know, they don't live in an isolated world. Right. You know, no, Bhutan is not, no, no one can be isolated anymore. So that's a yeah. big part of the pressure, too. Yeah, yeah. To, You're talking about, like, yeah, I mean, the other question is, how do you define happiness? <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a, Gross national, national, national happiness, happiness index rather than the money index, yeah. which is really in itself a stage four kind of measure. I mean, idea now, but beautifully uh, stretched in, in the edges and gone over the, that. That just that idea you could actually measure more of the human being than just the, the money aspects of it. Yeah. In our culture, uh, money spent on therapy is a positive thing in the yeah. sense that, you know, it's income and so it, it makes the economy higher. <laughs> but it could also be indicative that you have a very unhappy population. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm getting depressed now because I... <laughs> <laughs> you must have moved up. Yeah. <laughs> We're in very good company, don't worry. <laughs> 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 I, well, I have a master's degree in clinical social work, which came out of modernity, and it is a developmental achievement, if you will, biopsychosocial yes. assessment. And I'm realizing as I'm sitting here that when I'm conducting my meditation that in spite of myself, I'm looking at human beings in a developmental way, and the question that's coming up in my mind is, am I doing that too much? Or am I doing it at the right time? Like when we were talking in a group, like there's a time to go specific and there's a time to step back. And because once you've been taught something in a master's degree, you're kind of socialized into a world yes. view, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you are. And then you can't ever go back. And so anyway. and Can you go forward or beyond or have that as part of you? I'm, I like to talk about we have medicine bags with all our medicines in it. So you, that could be still good medicine for some people. You just need additional things in your medicine bag. Transcending and including. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yeah. It's yeah. not that it's not good. It's just yeah. that it tailored would again be now you're aware of which of the tools or practices you offer mm. are supporting the uh, people in general. There's some practices, meditation, to just because you don't have to even think of development sometimes. You just can do it. You can just be in that moment and have the peace and the experience of the expansiveness or whatever it is you're trying to communicate. Across the board, doesn't matter. People will take in what they're capable <coughs> of. And I would even venture to guess, I haven't measured it or seen the research, but I'm pretty sure it would be that some people at earlier stages or middle stages have wonderful, great depth in that and practice in that kind of transcending and then coming back and being, you know, their ordinary selves. Yes. And they're people who can more sustain that. Mm -hmm. And generally later stages do tend to help in the sustainability of, of 
flow states as well because you have more if you will flexibility and control over what, what's actually going on yeah yeah so well maybe the perception is different that you perceive things differently in a different stage right yes you you, you, you so would tell you, a different story mm -hmm. and so that's a piece i actually jumped over we make a really really i think important distinction between ego and it's just a word i mean we just don't have a better word and i use it because the forerunner Loringer, uh, who, um, whom I built my work, used that word. Freud, the Jews took it from used the ich, the selves. But how you, what word you use is one of those tricky things because it's a it's artificial choice. But I say ego is that function in us that will always try to tell a coherent story. No matter how wacky the story is, from the perspective of others, you can go in an insane asylum and listen to people what they tell you about what's happening to them. And to them it will be make sense. They're trying to do, the ego is doing that storytelling and trying to put whatever it is into, the, into one story that hangs together somehow or other. And that happens from all the way from early on as soon as you become verbal to all the way up into the transcendent realm because you have a story why this teacher is your best, the best possible teacher for you, you have a story why this particular spiritual approach is superior to this other one, why these practices, all of that is still story. We as human beings, I don't think we can help it, mm. we always <laughs> tell a story. Mm. And then you can look and that's what learning just started and what I continued and I guess Terry O'Fallon now says she's moving it even further is looking at thousands of those stories of self stories my experience of life in building it on a projective test which means people can say anything they like they don't read there's no right or wrong response I don't know have you all seen it sentence completion test, maybe not everybody. I actually haven't. Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah. But I just, you know, there are these little sentences raising a family yeah, and the client or the test taker just finishes the sentence and you have 36 di completely different stimuli. Yeah. Crime and delinquency could be halted, education is, uh, my mother and I mean, tapping into all sorts of different things that are so central for most human beings. Everybody has been either a child at some point or has children or people they relate to as offspring. Um, so you tap into those things and, and then you look at thousands, literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of responses and see is there, is there a commonality of the self identity and the theory then maps out those different identities that we can see when we look at zillions of responses I just I want to just go back a minute maybe it's the same thing you're saying but the, our capacity to create the narrative the story is it's, it's obviously so that makes us human I guess but I'm just struck by the way you're speaking about it, how important it is, and I just want to let that in. In other words, wherever we're at, our own development, and if we're our own development or working with others, our independent capacity to step back from our own experience, but also the cultural influences, is really an indication of development and sophistication and a bigger view. But it's just an important point. I, I, I think I, it is. I, I, you know, I do think it's an important yeah. point and an important <laughs> distinctions. How much awareness does the theory have about that? Yes. So several of the developmental theories are out there, but they don't ever define what the self is. They, they just assume. I mean, we don't know what it is. <laughs> the theory doesn't touch it. It describes how you think, it describes some behavioral patterns, but it doesn't say who is actually behind all of this, who does it, who wants it. So 
Yes, I think that's and the distinction between ego as what we call process, the, the one that digests and then interprets and then, you know, gives you a story about what, what all the things they experience, external and internal, and the patterns we can see in those stories, that distinction. <coughs> the theory is about the patterns. And that's your transcendent include also. I'm just struck by that. I mean, without that capacity functioning, we have a hard time transcending yet having a healthy integration and including. And um, that each step there is in some ways a healthy way of being it, and the more unhealthy, unbalanced uh, way of being it. Because how most often ego is used in the, in the sense of egoistic, selfish, ego attached, but that's not what we're talking here right. about, and that's part of that struggle is to finding the right distinctions, the right words. We talk on the way <laughs> over here, we actually right. talked about that. And it comes up no much, matter what much. you do, no matter what you discuss, at some point you become aware mm -hmm. of how naming whatever you're mm -hmm. naming is an act that then excludes other things. Yeah. Again, that boundary mm -hmm. thing, I'm not a coach. Well, there's a whole bunch of things outside yeah. and why that boundary what in you needs to to define it that way but even if you say you're coach also you're in the boundary yes yeah. so yeah. yes and so, sometimes on you know but there are good agreements and there are good reasons to have yeah. those boundaries and then there are times when it is more healthful not to have them yeah. Or at least be aware that that's what I am doing, or yes, that's what that will be the first step. Yeah. I'm not sure about that, but I always wonder. I think insight is important, but it's not yet enough. You can have plenty of out insight of how screwed up you are, mm -hmm. and do nothing about it. You know, not act, and yeah. not write a new story, not write a new play. Um, but just repeat the play you've been doing on the stage all along and direct it, you know, <laughs> with more more character, more sub personalities and all of that. But you're actually staying the same. You have to write the new play. So your your theory is based on a scientific study is what the current moment in the current mass, right? And you try to use scientific way of, of sit, sit through the patterns of what's going on, then it is always just sort of like a little step, you know, behind. It, it, I'm, I'm probably like a word to, so you just describe what's going on right now, right? So then, then what does the theory helping the world to move? Mm. Because the it, question. it is a map that goes from the <coughs> unconscious unity to conscious unity. Yeah. Up here you're actually fully conscious of how we are now. We haven't actually talked about what happens on this side. Here you build yourself, your separate, powerful, self offering etc., etc. self that can function, that can make decisions based on information, sifting information, prioritizing, all the things that we think a, a, a good adult, you know, can do. But what you don't have is a perspective on the process of doing that. Here you're starting to see, mm, so so what? If, if, if whatever I thought I knew and was true, now I'm questioning it. Now I'm realizing how many assumptions I made that can be tested and I watch other people, good heavens, you think about it, the same thing, we're right here, we're seeing this microphone from different angles, we did different <coughs> things, those guys do, those guys over there see the blinking light as well or not, is it only on this side, this, and when you start thinking about that, you become curious, yeah. <laughs> it's not blinking, <laughs> it's just <laughs> using it. <laughs> how what's even my relationship to the theories and I think but mm. 
the well initially that you can also look how somebody holds any theory obviously the expert holds it like an expert like the truth yeah. an achiever may say okay there's this theory this theory this theory and this theory i come they're all developmental thing i compare them and i like this set of teachers the best and i <coughs> like this particular approach fits my needs the best that just fits my personality the best the way they go about it so then you choose it and you follow that teaching it may be a much broader kind of teaching than down here with less prescription and more more in your toolkit than, than down here but it's still fairly uh, prescriptive yeah. like go out and, and give people a metaphor you, yeah. you listen to them and then you find one that matches them and then you give it you give it to them rather than the interesting question of them really listen what kind of metaphors are moving that person and what behind the matter what does that actually mean to them the particular metaphor there <coughs> and i don't know whether i'm repeating myself but i can tell you the, the most powerful experience I ever had with that was with a, an approach called clean language or symbolic modeling that I explored. I was just curious about it. And so the teacher said, well, um, I can give you a free session. You can just come and experience it. You will better. So I was telling them the story of a powerful story in my life. My mother died early. I have a seriously retarded sister and an older sister and a fairly, I would say, expert helpless father. So here it is, January, I stand at the grave, it's snowing, it's cold, and my sister, is, I hold her hand, she's little, uh, even so she's older, and felt that enormous burden, and I felt, and the way he described it was like a millstone around my neck. I will not be able to move at my own speed, at my own interest, because now I have to take care of this father and this retarded person. And the experience of that, so I talked about that. And within an hour, this whole thing, the way to just ask, there's a set of 20 questions. The coach is completely out of the picture. There's nothing about the coach. The skill is only which question when to ask. She got me to experience it as a life west, same, same shape, life west, <coughs> and we ended up, and it still moves me, it was a halo. Mm. In one mm. hour, wow. I said, that is, that is powerful coaching, it has nothing to do with levels, that has to do with the capacity as a coach to completely step out of and only be curious what's in that person, what do they mean with those words. You all have an idea what millstone around your neck might mean, but, but it was something entirely different what I meant and anybody else would mean because it was literally something different. And is what happened there developmental or something? Well, it changed, what, what? if you will, in that sense, it was transformational. It yes. changed my relationship to the thing. So that's, and yeah. there's nothing that says you can't do that kind of work with people as well. I'm giving it as a counterexample. Not everything has to be tailored coaching. The powerful approaches that are not depend, uh, depend on the level. Now, the level of awareness of a person to actually work with a system like that probably has something too. I, I would have a hunch that not everybody has such a transformative experience as I had. I was a, an easy client, if you will. Yeah. But still, the technique itself helped bring that forward, that transformation. One of the questions that's behind this for me is how much, if as developmental coaches, there might, there needs there's a need for distinguishing between the client need for horizontal growth versus vertical growth, right? So what you experienced was some expansiveness within your level of development, horizontally, or was it probably? That push, 
I don't even ask that question because my theory oh. is that my experience is that when we help people be at home wherever they are, more at home, more more fully at home, doesn't matter which level, more <coughs> embedded, more fitting to the environment, then so much energy gets free that they will naturally find openings for vertical growth. Then it's much easier. But if you start pulling somebody and kind of expecting them to grow vertically when yeah, yeah. they haven't even managed where they are at yet, then yes, then you get might get resistance, which is a, uh, an interesting word, or you will just not need. It may take many more sessions than necessary. Yeah. So does that? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <coughs> so you have the innate capacity to be happy. Therefore, he, you are able to reach to that point. So in other words, that's the, that we're all innately, intrinsically happy and at peace. Somehow, because of that, we have that capacity, therefore, you are coachable, that you're able to be brought out into that state. Well, so yes? let's make a distinguish, distinction between state and stages. Okay. And yes, there is some yearning I think we all have, I don't know whether it's capacity for happiness or for sensing when we are unhappy, maybe we can't even name it, we're just feeling stress. The system tells us something, whatever, we can't even define it. So then, then the, the, to me the first question is always how serious is that stress and does it need more like therapy or medical attention or is it actually appropriate for a coaching relationship? <laughs> So I'm just chat. I'm just yeah. questioning the quality. You know the the, the yeah. yeah. What's so, human? You know this this innate quality. The innate quality. I would say there is a obviously a tendency to grow, certainly to a certain level. These series say not everybody goes beyond the middle here, or not even everybody. We just looked at it yesterday at the conference. I think they said seventy percent of people of any Western Western developed countries around here, and maybe 10-15% even earlier. So we have very few that actually are over here. And so the work we have to do is mostly with people at these levels, in all situations, in corporations, individually, um, the sort of integral crowd where, where there are many people self-identify later, that's a different story. <laughs> Okay, this is, these words are coming up for me and I don't even know what they mean, but maybe there's a distinction between, to be made between the human world and the life world. I don't even know what that means, okay? So it's like what your need was, was like the life world need versus something that happens more in the human sphere. Well, it, basically language, but I don't know. I just threw it out there because it was just in my head. I have to I'm not trying to explore it a little more. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just let it let it <coughs> okay. Life world, you mean the whole ecosystem, trying, everything included? I'm trying to nuance the quality of that transformation without saying state and stages and more of tailor coaching and stuff like that. Like so now they have this metaphor, right? There's like, but so I don't now know. If I were a clean language person, I would want to know what this actually holds and means. Did you just see her do that? Right. Yeah. So that's so. So that's I don't know yet. That she so has a verse that. for, yeah. but that's like in there atmosphere. in that. Yeah, but they move. You see. Yeah, not, yeah. So but not I mean, like just this, not like a core, and there's some, yeah, yeah. So this, right? So, so as a, as a Basic coaching, regular coaching, if you're a good coach, you notice these kinds of things, you notice body language, you notice pauses, you notice the speed of how somebody uh, talks and you try to in some way either challenge it by changing your speed or to match it. <coughs> and the fundamental, I think that's true for all coaching, the more you can match the client both where they are developmentally and who they are as, as people, what their preferences are, if they're more kinetic 
language or more thinking language or whether they use more feeling language, matching any one of these items will give you greater rapport than when you miss it. When you talk about thoughts, when the client constant, you know, just in general approaches things more through the feeling side. That These are the, the skills that if they're in your bag or on it, also going to be a more effective and caring coach than when you don't have those sensibilities and they're not necessarily stage related. Mm. Mm. Not, not necessarily stage related. Not necessarily. Again, one, more would, one would assume that truly a mature person would have more of those on board than somebody who is less developed. But in general, these are good things and they're not stage related. My capacity to notice um, and often that's actually an interesting one of my clients I have a, a very successful company in Dallas and I'm teach, um, coaching the executive team some of them and each one of the people I have is so different I have to do totally different things with them and one of them I spent considerable time with just learning in a, in a meeting to look at the body language of others and then not to show and then learn to modify her own body language. And, and that this is not, I mean, this is developmental. That ha helps the person become more effective. But it is not tailored coaching it, other than that I noticed that she needed that. I guess in that sense it is. And I wouldn't talk about TA, I wouldn't talk about uh, that, just that. You learn to pay attention to this particular thing and it will make a difference in how your meetings run. Um, but it's the paying attention and that has to do something probably with the level of the coach, how much they can pay attention both to what's going on inside and to what what's actually happening for the other person. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just one quick thing. But the opposite happens too because like people whose ego development, to use that very clear phrase, that are here, that I meet a lot, they're like starving for that relationship. So, so a lot of times they go through spiritual communities with wonderful teachers. Like, uh, I happen to think Shin Zen Young is a wonderful teacher, mm -hmm. but he's not construct aware. And and people know I like him, so they go there and they, they're unsatisfied. And there's a, there's a very deep, profound need to have that when you're up here, too. You can't mm -hmm. just have a transformative experience. It leaves you starving. For more, or for, for having a community of others who could Yeah, it's not say, just for more. It's actually you're starving in a different way, I yes. would say. So we you can describe the development in many, way, many ways. You can say at earlier stages you look for a community of like believing, of like, how would I say, value, people who have similar values as yourself. Then you could say, well, people who have similar cognitive capacities, like-minded. Then later on, you even look for like-spirited people. They can be very diverse, but mm -hmm. what, what you really yearn for is somebody who is in some spiritual sense of a similar life. We all need that. We all need, I mean, the phrase, uh, the birds of a feather flock together. Yeah. It's actually deeply descriptive of something, again, human. Yeah. Yes, we can be generous. Yes, we can be at the later stage and really, really focused and willing and happy to serve all the levels. But at some point, we need some nourishment and support as well. Yeah. So the recommendation is always, it's a lonely <coughs> place, too. The later you are, the lonelier, as even statistically, it gets. <laughs> And not only that, when we imagine uh, growth, we, you know, we can any development, we can also describe uh, the spiral. The spiral is opening up. There are fewer people and there are more ways of actually being at these later stages than there are at the earlier ones. 
So then people often come and, and describe that loneliness. Yeah. And this is kind of goes back to what you were saying about support. Yes. How in our own development, we absolutely need to monitor the uh, work with these two fronts, of working with the whole spectrum, however that's defined, and then also taking care of ourselves. Yes. In all the our own developmental needs, and for some it's different. Some need more of a philosophical tribe. Some need more of a, you know, what a spiritual meditation, not beyond the mind mm -hmm. tribe, or whatever, you know. And then if we all go home for Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> our biological tribes. <laughs> um, <coughs> But anyway, yeah, I, it's great to hear that because I was thinking earlier about development and how there is a bias I'm noticing in my own mind toward I want to get out there and do it, you know. But uh, whether it's my myself or working with someone else, I'm just hearing the way that you are, what you're saying and how you're saying it. I just, it feels so, ah, oh, I can just slow down. <laughs> Not that I'm, I'm, I, anyway, but just listen. And uh, development is an innate thing, like you're saying, Echo. And the agenda, like it's totally relax. And take the time to really get, talk to the individual. And just listen and find out who they are. That's the big and, question. Who are you? What is it? I say it even differently. What is it like to be you? What is it like to be that person in their shoes and with their eyes, in their environment, in their history, all of that? What is it like to be you? And I think one of the most healing things for human beings is to be listened to. How few times do you get somebody to truly listen to you? Yes, yes. I find that, I don't want to say the best compliment, but Maybe it is the best compliment that I can receive as a coach is when someone says that they felt maybe for the first time fully seen and heard. Yes. And it's, you know, forget what we accomplished or anything else. Although you know, I try to do that too. But that they, they said they felt seen and heard. And that's a big deal. Um, you know, I, I think we all from the other end of that. I mean, I like feeling seen and heard for. Myself. We all do, we yeah. all need to. I mean, yeah. again, we're not with the idea that we're separate individuals in the skin bag. Yes. You know how, how, what a foolish idea that is. But here, at this level, there is a good sense that that's so. With all the scientific knowledge I may have, that I uh, have more bacteria in my gut than there are stars in the <laughs> You know. <laughs> It, it, it is sort of external knowledge. It doesn't actually affect, at this level, my sense of self, that there is no boundary. It just, I'm, I'm, with every breath I'm exchanging with the environment. The idea of a separate self, that was so central to Western ideas about life, is so limited. So here starts, the boundary starts to be deconstructed. So we say this is the construction of the separate self and this is the deconstruction stepwise. First you just notice that the same reality can be looked at in very different ways and interpreted in many many different ways. And that the second level of deconstruction is not just that there is one reality we can look at in many many different ways. There are actually innumerable realities because they're all based on a unique, on the pattern of language and using words to describe reality. But they're all individually flavored as well from, from all our history, from our upbringing. So here this is a much deeper kind of uncertainty. This we call relative. Everything is relative, yes, but here it's even more profound. There's no place to stand on. Yeah. It's all the tension between, I think Pascal said it best in his, in his, in his thoughts, um, 
meditative thoughts actually 1600 or when did he live quite a while ago yeah 15s maybe even I may be always confused which place place Pascal Place, yeah, 16th, right? Yeah, that's 1600. Okay, well, anyway, the, the idea that I got from him that struck me in high school, I was just dumbfounded. It changed my life. <laughs> you were in high school in 1600? That's amazing. <laughs> I say it that way, yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> Maybe I was, those who believe in reincarnation might not find that an impossible idea, and I do actually, but you know, it's a possibility, it's a story, it's another story that is helpful yeah. for some people. It's fine. And what you got out of it was what? What did you say? Yeah, yeah. Well, we had to read the stuff from Pascal said that human beings compared to nothingness are an everything and human beings compared to everything, everything are a nothingness. Nothing. And the, the teacher actually gave us the mathematical transcription of that. One compared to zero is an infinity or goes towards infinity. One compared to an infinity goes towards zero as a you know, mathematical uh, thing, mm -hmm. and it completely, completely just said, oh my God, yes, that's the tension I feel, that's that not finding a place to stand, because I'm aware of both, yes. and so that's a later stage kind of uncertainty, and he, uh, I think really Wilbur says that, well, also he doesn't often point to it is you suffer just as much. It's not that you get happier with every level, uh, but it bothers, bothers you less. less. Mm -hmm. because, because of what? What do people at later stages have that early stages do not have? Perspective on it. Perspective. Mm -hmm. In the resources. Less identity with ego. Yes. More capacity to you know, honestly and straightforwardly look at reality and at their own shortcomings and the, the way the mind plays tricks on us and accepting that we all have biases no matter how hard we try, except some of them are hardwired, all of that. Where does curiosity come in? Because, like, you get really curious about, <laughs> you know, because you have a perspective on the unhappiness or the sadness or the thing, it becomes... Lifeline. Um, it's fascinating, you know. It, it's as equally fascinating. The fascination, the awe, doesn't end. So that's like a perspective on it. I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you're standing from when you have that perspective. But a, a kind of radical openness, I would say, and finding precisely the in between and the tension between the two, like walking on the edge of a sword. That's where it's the most juicy. For the for truly, truly curious about what life is. But to me, that's what it's like. It all is just bald curiosity. Like, but I think there's a moment of. <laughs> I might get in trouble, but there's a moment Good. of <laughs> non be just not curious. There is no curiosity, and I'm thinking about um, the awareness of no self. Now, it's, there's a moment where there's just no, no, no thing, including curiosity. Mm -hmm. But then curiosity definitely happens. But there's a moment just before, and I think also none of what we're talking about is about it being static, but it's part of a fluid. Dynamic fluid. Yeah. In and out, and even states. We, we, even during the regular days, we go through states. Yes. Every night, you go through states. This is also part of our birthright, if you will. Yeah. But there is a difference when we talk about growing up and waking up. Waking up has a different tail, a different target than growing up. Yeah. And I would be kind of happy if. <laughs> can, can we talk about something that? Um, did I interrupt you? I'm always interrupting. That's okay. Um, like one of the things that I, I'm, I don't know why this popped in, but like one of the things that people that I work with 
have trouble with is like um, we've been talking a lot about unitive and we're all <coughs> one and I don't want to overemphasize that but then um, people start to get very aware of how unique they are and at first like for a long time they might be in these you know unique self courses or something and I think it's a really cool idea then all of a sudden they start to really experience how unique they are. Oh, we did this in our retreat. Yeah. And they end up being, what it hits them. And then they really, and I tease them, you know, like, well, like, you see people are really afraid that, that most of their experience is not shared, that, that they actually are, they all of a sudden they realize how unique they are, the other side of it, and they get terrified, right? Because it's an obligation. If you know how unique you are, then you have to live your unique self, and that's a huge invitation. Right. So there's like, when does that toggle between people just, you know, a lot of people are in these communities chasing your unique self, but they're self-conventional, and they're all doing the ritual stuff, and then, then there's a toggle where like, it boom, that happened in our retreat, and the people were yes. like, oh my God, you know? Yes. And, For good reason, because it is, once you really get it. Is that is that up here somewhere, or that's just no? Kind that of could be anywhere. It's more again more likely to yeah. happen up here because there's more resources, more capacity to watch what's yeah. going on um, that here. But it could happen here too. And it's when you look at sort of all the teachings and coaching to go back to coaching a little bit about purpose. What's your purpose? Down here, the purpose is usually, you know, what do you want to do, what professions do you want to choose? And later here, the purpose is a much more deeper one that is attached to what is your unique gift you, that you have been given. And how are you going to translate that in service of others and yourself? It's not either or. That's a different kind of purpose. That's the other switch that happens. All your life you realize you've taken, 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 the earth's given, people have been given, and all of a sudden, then there's a switch, yeah. Yeah. right? And that comes with it at first is terrifying. And I people. think some of that has to do with personality. But like you said, curiosity is clearly one of the ways, if you want, of, of the intelligences or of... Different people have different temperaments. Some of mm. us, you and I, we know that, yeah. have talked about it, are just immensely curious. And that is probably a, something that right. propels people more likely towards exploring and experimenting and asking fundamental questions than somebody who is naturally not so curious. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a paradox, isn't it, unique and uh, unitive? Yeah. Yes, well, they're, they're, yes. <coughs> because there are, you, there are things we have all in common. We all tell stories, no matter what culture, what group we're coming for. We all know to some degree we're born, we live a life. Usually, let's assume we have one life and we're going to die. The question is then, what is that which that recognizes the uniqueness? What is that? And is that we all have? The soul. The What's awareness, the, the self-awareness, yes. the stepping outside of and observing. Isn't that the key and, aspect? And just that? also experience to realize where you are different in a unique, unique is an interesting way, where you are different than anybody else. And what, which, and sometimes there's more than one difference you could recognize, but what is it specifically that would have the most impact, I guess would be the word, or be the most useful, and, and sometimes that's a guess. You don't know, and you can't know beforehand. Right. you got to keep, you got to go, though. It's, it's almost well, like looking, yeah. too, you look closer and closer and closer, and, you know, then eventually you see everything. Like right, like you're you're spotting a spot and you're looking deeply into it and studying and being Thinking. with it, and eventually it becomes like everything. There's like it's like a. I I have think about this often as I I can't distinguish identity and purpose. Mm -hmm. If I go one side, if I go um, too much to the side of what's my purpose, then I start 
is feeling like a failure because Anderson Cooper's not interviewing me on CNN. And then I realize I've gotten away from the questions of a self with a capital S. So I, I, then I know I have to slow down when I go into, I'm supposed to do this. And, uh, but, and yet when I'm, when things are um, kind of like this, the way you were doing, Bonnie, when things are working that way, my sense of self and flow of purpose seems to be effortless and um, not not a question even, mm -hmm. uh, but not always. But yeah. yeah, but that's we call that simple kind of way explanation. You're in a flow, yeah. then you lose your sense of time off, and you use your sense of separate self. But that time, you, we also function at our best and our trainings for coaches, we do, that's one exercise we do, is say, draw, what does it look like when you're coaching at your best? What, what image do you have for that? Yeah. And that's really yeah. tapping into the flow. What is it when, yeah. and you will again see when we do it, and, we could do it right now. Actually, I'm totally lost time. So, since do we have any? Do we have any time? When did we start? You know that sort of thing. Does it's anybody nice. need a break? It's two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. Who's running this? We start around three something. Yeah, that's just, probably just three two o'clock. Four fifty-five. Yeah. Four fifty-five now. Yeah. So we have another half hour. Yes, yeah, so does. But I could imagine that somebody might need a quickie. Break, uh, so break? let's take a break. But just short. Yeah, couple, just a bio break is what they call it now. Mm -hmm. Yes. And water in, water out. See yeah, what, the, uh, what's with you when you're on your break. Yeah, what's see, urgent or what, you, what would you really like to deal with or ask or grapple with in the next half hour or so? Just be careful what you say because the recording is still on. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the water and water out. <laughs>